And I think we are live. Welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. All right. So today we're going to be talking about what about free grace the theology. Let's get this thing out of the way here. What about free grace theology? I get a lot of questions about free grace theology. I get questions about, uh, let me see if I can fix something here. I get questions about provisionism, questions about this kind of thing. And what I want to do now, we recently did a video on um, the Mammon Church, and I did two videos on the faith crisis. And the way I get these questions, it's difficult for me to answer without taking you through all of that material first, okay? So as soon as you hear free grace, a lot of people lob onto it, and, and I would have as a well, okay, as a non-Calvinist, probably, I don't know, four years ago as a non-Calvinist, already doing non-Calvinist videos, I probably would have jumped right on the free grace bandwagon and said, yes, that's me, that's me, okay. Um, so... <laughs> Let's look at that in light of what we've done recently. So I want to encourage you to look at some of the videos that we've done recently. And if you haven't seen them yet, we've done a video on the Mammon Church. And we covered this chart. Today we're going to be looking at this chart again because that's very important. And we did a video on the Faith Crisis. We did Faith Crisis Part 1 and Faith Crisis Part 2. If you have watched those videos, you are going to be better equipped and better prepared and better able and ready to hear what I'm going to say today. My cat's coming into my office right now. So um, you can listen to this if you haven't seen those, those yet, but those are kind of, those videos are kind of re-baseline type of videos. Now speaking of the videos that we do, I tried to give you a break between those so everybody can kind of catch up with the, with the content that we have going. If you like the content that we have here, we are 100% viewer supported from donations from people like you. So if you like what's going on here, if you want to see more content like this, uh, we invite you to support the channel. The details to do so are in the description below. All right. If uh, when, when that support dries up, we'll either quit or start advertising or something. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, we are 100% viewer supported. Now... We already have a couple comments. Oh, I got here early for once. Yeah, I got also got a new mug for Father's Day. It's a, somebody, uh, my daughter got me a Star Wars mug and it has a lightsaber handle on it. So I'll be able to, uh, you know, do some choppy choppy if somebody's not playing, playing right, playing fair. So what do we want to do? We want to look at this Mammon Church stuff and this faith crisis stuff as we talk about free grace theology. Um, where do I start on this? Let's look at what free grace is. Now, uh, don't be jumping on for or against this free grace thing just yet. Okay? Because I suspect there's a lot of people in the audience who are looking at this propositionally. Okay? Now, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger um, so you can see it a little bit better. And what is this? This is a Wikipedia article. Kevin, why are you using Wikipedia? Because Wikipedia is just what's out there. It's what's out there. Okay, You can't say that I went to some proprietary source that nobody knows about, that kind of thing. Free grace is a Christian evangelical view that anyone can receive eternal life the moment they believe uh, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Free grace advocates belief uh, that... Good works are not the condition to merit, maintain, or to prove eternal life, but are part of discipleship and the basis for receiving eternal rewards. Now, in the parenthesis, it distinguishes itself there from Catholics, Arminians, and Calvinists. So, good works are not the condition to merit, as with Catholics, maintain, as with Arminians, or to prove, as with Calvinists, eternal life, but are part of discipleship and the basis for receiving eternal rewards, that kind of thing. So a lot of people who, if you're anti-Calvinist, you would probably uh, agree with that kind of thing. The, uh, the grace gift of eternal life is said to be free only as a condition, as the only condition for receiving it is initial faith. This view distinguishes between salvation and discipleship to call, believe, Christ and Savior. 
and to receive the gift of eternal life, to call the follow. So here, let me let me tell you what I think first, okay? Um, as we go into this, my understanding of free grace. Before we get into this article, we're not going to get into this article a whole lot because we're going to take a different direction. We're going to we're going to look at this through the lens of the Mammon Church video that we did, and we're going to evaluate it that way. My understanding of of free grace theology is that it is a well intended attempt to combat Calvinism. However, the problem with it is that like many other attempts to combat Calvinism, it retains Calvinistic thinking. It retains Calvinistic presupposition and it is paradigmatic. It is not metaparadigmatic. It is paradigmatic. It is proposition centric. Okay. That's the issue with it. You may be thinking, well, it has the right it has the right doctrines, and what you mean by that is right propositional truth claims about what is so, how salvation works, that kinds of thing. That's not what we're aiming for as Christians according to the New Testament from what we've been putting out on this channel. Now, we don't want incorrect propositions, of course, but what I mean by that is we don't want only propositions. There are four kinds of knowing. Propositional knowing is only one of them. Okay, So we want to expand beyond that. So I see it as a good faith, sound attempt to try to promote a biblical view of salvation that is opposing to Calvinism. The problem is it is proposition centric, just like all the other systematic theologies that are out there. They have their own systematic theology. They make the mistake of believing that passages of scripture are written as inputs to systematic theology, which that is a huge mistake. A lot of people, a lot of people don't realize that they're making, and uh, some of the propositions aren't even good. So let's look at a few of these things. Um, it goes through the history. You can read this article yourself, and it goes through the history of the early church, Reformation, and Protestant proponents. And I'm not saying I agree with all of this article. Um, you know, you know how it is on the internet, and plus this is. Uh, <laughs> This is, you know, Wikipedia at that, okay? So Zane Hodges is one of the main names that gets dropped here. Grace Evangelical Society is an organization that gets dropped here. I think it came up um, in 1986 was when it got started, if you back it up a little bit. Okay. And some of the proponents are like Lewis Sperry Chafer, C.I. Schofield, now J. Vernon McGee. Now, I don't know why they would say this, because J. Vernon McGee is a Presbyterian and a Calvinist. Now, he was kind of like a, uh, like a Chuck Swindoll Calvinist. But, no, not a Ch Chuck Swindoll's down here on this list. I mean, Charles Spurgeon. He's <laughs> like a Charles Spurgeon. I'm looking at this name right here, and that's what threw me off. He's more like a Charles Spurgeon Calvinist, uh, more so than some of these, you know, young restless reform types. But Chuck Swindoll, uh, J. Vernon McGee is a Calvinist. Charles Stanley is a Calvinist. So I don't I don't know how they formulated this list. This list doesn't make any sense to me. Some of the some of the names I would understand, some of them I would not. If the Grace Evangelical Society was formed in 1986 and C.I. Schofield was doing his work back in 1917, uh, mm, it's kind of all over the place. Um, Dallas Theological Seminary has a problem with Calvinism, so I guess it's taught there by some people. They have Zane Hodges listed here, all right, as one of the people. Um, Free Grace Alliance, uh, Grace Evangelical Society. So I got an email from somebody I'm going to show you. It was founded. The Grace Evangelical Society was founded in 1986. Maybe I should lead with the email and show you the email that somebody wrote. They said, Hello, Brother Kevin. I was just wondering, since you're not a Calvinist, Arminian, or Lordship, <laughs> like those are the only options, are you a free grace theology believer? I know you're a fundamental. I think you meant to say fundamentalist. But have you ever heard of free grace theology like the late Dr. Zane Hodges or Dr. Robert Wilkin of GES Grace Evangelical Society? I listen to you with all the great info you put out. GES are not Calvinists, are many in lordship. Thank you for your ministry and happy Father's Day. All right, so I appreciate this email and thanks to, if you want to write a question in, um, I will address your question. I might address it in a video and if I do, I will not include your name, okay? So you will remain anonymous if you send me an email. So... Now, 
I'm going to break this down and I don't, um, I hope the sender of this email does not take this personally, but the, the question like this, if you're not Calvinist or many our Lordship, are you free grace theology believer? What is that? It's another proposition centric belief system. That's what that is. And the problem with modern Christians is you can only think in propositional belief systems. You can't think outside of that. You can't think metaparadigmatically above the belief systems themselves. It's like you have to be in some kind of defined belief system. You have to be in accordance with some kind of systematic theology. When you read your Bible, you read words like repentance as if they are some kind of input into an overarching theory on repentance that you will call the doctrine of repentance, and every mention of repentance must fit into that overarching doctrine. You read the Bible that way. It doesn't matter what that is, whether you have a free grace idea of repentance or a Calvinist version of repentance, the idea of doing that, of thinking that there is an overarching, overarching doctrine of repentance into which all of these things were written to be inputs, that is wrong way of thinking. It's the wrong way of thinking. And that's not the way we are thinking. That's not the way you should think. That's not the way you should address Scripture. So let's go back to this article and point out a couple of things um, and show, show a couple of things. So they have beliefs. They have core beliefs. So if you have core beliefs, you are a proposition like this and you write them down. doesn't matter whether you agree with them or not. Now, I would you know, probably tend to be the kind of person that would agree with a lot of what is said here. I'm not going to go through all the eaches and individuals of these things. But the problem isn't, not, isn't whether or not you agree with these propositions. That is paradigmatic thinking. That is one-dimensional thinking. That's proposition entrapment. That's propositional tyranny to think that it stops there, okay? Why would I say that? Think for a second, okay? Think, <laughs> if free grace theology is correct, if all the propositions were correct, let's presume they are just for the sake of argument for this minute right here. Um, it doesn't really help the person to just take that theology and cram it down their throat, okay? Now, what have they become? They've become an automaton. They've become a representative of somebody else's propaganda. And now, if those happen to be true, they happen to be spewing correct propaganda, but that's all they're doing. They're just a, an avatar, a mouthpiece for somebody else's propaganda, whether or not it is correct. That is not what we want to make of people. That's not what we want to do with people. If so, what's another way to look at that? If free grace theology is correct, we want to tr help somebody transform into the kind of person that could generate free grace theology on their own and that would come to the correct conclusions on the fly as they encounter people in scripture and other types of input, other types of data input. Okay, so. How how would so you might ask the question presuming free grace free grace theology is theology is correct, how does one arrive at free grace theology from scratch, all right? And then you ask the question, how do I edify a person to where I can produce a person that has the skill set that can arrive at those correct conclusions? That's what we're after here, among many other things. We're not after taking a set of of presupposed correct doctrines and then just, you know, rote memorization and indoctrinating people with those things. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Besides, one of the benefits you get when you teach people how to think instead of what to think is that once they learn how to think, they start to show you the errors in your thinking as well as in other people's. So it's, it's like a self-correcting system, and you want to leave uh, any kind of thing like this open to self-correction, all right? You don't want to have things, everything written down, and it takes three years in an act of Congress to change the church, you know, bylaws and doctrine and constitution and statement of faith, and you don't want all that kind of nonsense, okay? You want a self-correcting system. So we don't want this propositional nonsense. What is this? Propositional nonsense. We don't want it. Um, dispensationalism. We don't, we don't need to start with dispensationalism. We need to start with first principles thinking. We don't need to start with a doctrine of assurance. We need to start with first principles thinking. 
We don't need to start with free grace theology approaches the doctrine of repentance. That shows you bad thinking right there. Assuming Wikipedia is correctly representing free grace theology proponents, which I'm pretty sure it's representing at least some of them correctly. Okay, so there, you don't look at repentance as there being a doctrine of repentance. What you look at repentance as it is a word that appears in some passages. And every time it appears, you interpret it in the context in which it appears every single time. Don't try to come up with an overarching theory into which you must combine everything. That's not how the Bible was written. And one of the big mistakes we make is to think that it was written for that purpose. And it was not. All right. The content of saving faith. Uh, thanks for the super chat, <laughs> Jamie Russell. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, content of saving faith. Comparison. Okay, here's a good one here. Comparison to the five points of Reformed theology. All right. This is a good one. Um, over here you have the, t the tulip. Okay. And I'm going to show you two things in here. You have the tulip, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, um, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. All right. Uh, there we go. Hopefully, hopefully that's a little bit easier to read. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. Now, one of the problems that non-Calvinists make, and one of the reasons I started doing video, uh, probably the main reason I started doing videos on Calvinism, um, was because I find that th the other material against Calvinism is severely lacking for a lot of different reasons. And Calvinism is one of those things, it's like once you see it, you can't unsee it. And so even if you are against it, you keep promoting it in clandestine presuppositional ways without realizing it. All right. And that's a, that's a problem. And it's pervasive throughout a lot of theology, theological works. It's just, it's worked its way into, into lexicons and dictionaries and all kinds of other things. If you look up predestination, you'll get one of the definitions they'll give you is Augustinian predestination rather than what the word actually means. Okay. That kind of thing. It's everywhere. And it's hard to not see once you see it. So there's two things I want to point out here that are, that are serious problems, okay? Unconditional election, we know this is wrong uh, because we know Calvinism is wrong and we have lots and lots of videos on that. We have like pro close to 300 videos exposing Calvinism, covering all the verses, all that kind of stuff. So what do we have here? God desires, this is free grace side. God desires that all persons should come to him, to faith in him, and election is according to God's foreknowledge of faith. Well, on the surface, if you say that, you have 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2. So technically those words are in alignment with 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2. The problem though, is that the person who wrote that and the way they are using election, they do not differentiate biblical election from Augustinian election. Okay, that's the problem. They are presuming that election equals salvation in both cases. So the way they use election here is the same way the Calvinist uses the word election. That is a huge problem. But even if they had it correct, it's still propositional and it's still wrong for that reason. All right. Even if they were, even if they were correctly identified that, hey, election is not to conversion, but it's to service. Well, that would be correct. And they're elected to what? According to God's foreknowledge, not to be saved, but for the service that is listed as you keep reading in 1 Peter. Service and blessing that follows, okay? Here's another one. Here's Calvinistic thinking and non-Calvinistic doctrine. And this is one of the problems. <laughs> Pair character holding his belly, laughing out loud. That's funny. Over here on the right... Jesus died. Okay, we know limited atonement is wrong because, you know, we've studied this out. We have, you know, lots and lots of videos on this. Okay. Um, since God only, this is the Calvinist view. Since God only elects some and not others, Christ's death on the cross only applies to the elect, therefore did not die for the entire world. Here, what are they not telling you? I'll tell you what they're not telling you in just a second. Here, Jesus died for everyone, but is only effective for those who believe in Christ. What is that? That is limited atonement. That's the same doctrine of limited atonement, just worded a different way. What's the problem? What is the underlying presupposition here? The underlying presupposition 
is that Christ dying for people is what saved them. That's not what saved anybody. I know that sounds heretical. Now, don't get me wrong. You cannot be saved without the death of Christ. Okay? Christ's death is necessary for salvation, but not sufficient. It is not what saves. The Bible says in Romans 5.10, we shall be saved by his life. In Romans 4.25, it says, raised again for our justification. If you um, deny the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15.17, if Christ be not raised from the dead, then your faith is in vain. You are yet in your sins. When Christ died, everybody was still in their sins. Christ's death did not secure the salvation of anybody. Anybody. We are saved by Christ's life, Romans 5.10, and we are saved by the washing of regeneration, renewing with the Holy Ghost, Titus 3.5. We are never told anywhere that Christ's death saved us. We're never told that Christ's blood saved us. Now, I'm not against the blood. You can't be saved without it. It's like, uh, it's like gas in your car. If you were to say, hey, I, I drove all the way to Tallahassee on one tank of gas. No, you didn't. You also had a car, you see. But we talk that way all the time. So when we say saved by the blood, I think we all know that we mean we're saved. You can't be saved without the blood and that the blood is necessary for salvation. But you also can't be saved without faith. You also can't be saved without the resurrection. So any limited atonement argument is essentially, and a Calvinist is not going to deny the resurrection of Christ, but a limited atonement argument is essentially a denial of the resurrection of Christ. To say that, Christ secured the salvation of the elect on the cross. I've heard them say that over and over again. You could probably look that up on, the, you know, you could probably Google that in like five seconds. But that is, that is, that, that statement constitutes a denial of the necessity of the resurrection. So this kind of thing, free grace theology has all kinds of Calvinistic errors in it. I don't, I think they're just mistakes. I don't think these people are evil or bad or anything like that. I think they're People have presuppositions, and it's difficult to work through presuppositions, which is one of the reasons this channel exists, is to try to... And, and when I start talking like this, people say, Kevin, you have presuppositions too. I know, I know. Uh, <laughs> we, we deceive ourselves all the time. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to not deceive ourselves. Somebody asked, what is first principles thinking in the chat here? First principles thinking is to go all the way back to the base set of information that you can possibly go to every time you encounter data, all right? Now, I'm gonna say this, I've said this before. I have a Bible over here. <clears throat> every time you go to scripture, you would think, like if I go to say John 10, 28, you might think something like, oh, well that supports the doctrine of eternal security. No, 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 no. John was not thinking of the doctrine of eternal security when he wrote that. So what I'm gonna do when I come to that verse is I'm going to ask a whole bunch of questions every single time. And when I come to a conclusion, I'm not going to keep that conclusion and write it down and make a doctrine out of it. Next time I come to the verse, I'm going to ask my questions again. And you say, well, that sounds so long and boring and tedious. Why would you do this whole thing over and over again? Because <laughs> there are certain things you cannot understand until you have transformed appropriately. Okay? So as soon as you write something down and you say, this is the doctrine, this is the meaning, this is the conclusion, what that does is that stultifies you from regaining new information later on when you have the parallax of your future self to look back and see it differently. Right? So you have to leave space open for that. Secondly, um, first principles thinking may sound tedious at first, but think of it kind of like reading. We are not used to doing first principles thinking. First principles thinking, you're going to ask the question why over and over and over again. In the book, Super Thinking, he says you want to ask the five whys. Keep asking why, 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 why this, why that. You get an answer, but why that? You keep asking that question until, until you can't anymore. You get all the way down to the bottom of it for sure. And then you build back up from there out to where you are and where you live today. Do that every single time. Seems tedious right now, but what happens, kind of like reading, Listening to a child who's like a four-year-old who's learning to read, very tedious to sit there and listen to them sound out all the words and letters. But 
in short amount of time, you get very fluid and very rapid with it. So what we want to do is we want to have first principles thinking fluency. We want to have epistemic fluency. And the only reason, the only way you can transform into a person who has epistemic fluency is to constantly practice first principles thinking all the time as a way of being, okay? You don't arrive at a whole bunch of conclusions and then just pass down the London Baptist Confession of 1689 for 400 years to the next 400 you know, years worth of generations of people. You don't do that because then those people aren't practiced in the first principles thinking. So we don't want, we don't want to come to a set of correct conclusions that we pass down to other people. We want to generate people who are constantly transforming, who can constantly update our conclusions. That's what we want to generate. So we're we're focused on the transformation of people, not on the arrival at correct conclusions. So let's look at the Mammon Church, our chart here. Now, this may seem very daunting when you look at this. We covered this. We covered each of these points one by one in our video on the Mammon Church. And that's why I encourage you to watch that as a prerequisite to this. That is necessary. So Notice the four kinds of knowing down here. I'm going to highlight the four kinds of knowing. And in, in the Mammon Church, but let, me, let me start at the bottom down here. The paradigmatic stuff down here at the bottom. I can make a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger version of this. The paradigmatic stuff you see down here, you have Calvinism, you have Provisionism, you have Arminianism, Dispensationalism, Catholicism, Lutheranism, Covenant Theology, Atheism, Agnosticism. But, you know, something else you could put down there would be free grace theology. You know, it's just another paradigmatic system, set of conclusions, all right? And even if they were correct, you don't want to be parad paradigmatic. What you want to be is metaparadigmatic. First principles thinking is applied fluidly in all situations. We have no attachment to propositional conclusions. So even if you read a verse and you're like, well, according to this verse, uh, <laughs> Repentance means this. You would not hold on to that and identify to that. You would be open to correction. And the next time you come to that verse, you wouldn't just resort back to your previous conclusion. You would go through the process again. That's how, that's your way of being. All right. <clears throat> yeah. Somebody said the resurrection is not in, not in any of the points of the tulip. That's right. It's a, it's a pretty, pretty interesting thing to leave out of huh, your main points of doctrine. So let's look at a couple of things. In free grace theology, it is still has the problem, like the Mammon Church, it is still propositional. We don't want propositional theology. We want to span across all four kinds of knowing, participatory, perspectival, perspectival procedural, and propositional, okay? We're not getting rid of propositional, but we want to use all four kinds of knowing. We have a video on the four kinds of knowing that we did with cognitive science professor John Verveke back at the end of September. So look up that video, the four kinds of knowing, if you want to know more about that. That's one of the biggest ways you can think when you're thinking, you know, a lot of people are, they're converting over to Eastern Orthodox right now. Well, it's got the same problem. Now it does have some more, it has more participatory stuff in it. It has more perspectival stuff, but it also has some really weird jacked up propositional stuff. Okay. So that you don't want to lock yourself into any particular paradigm. You can look at them all and see the good parts of it and maybe glean the good parts from any particular system, but you don't want to align yourself and emotionally identify with any particular system like that. And if you happen to, un don't I, uh, understand huh, the how epistemically incommensurate it is and get what's worth out of it, don't identify with it, okay? You have formulaic arguments and you indoctrinate people. You do that in free grace theology. Up here, you want to have genuine personal interaction. You want to have curiosity. You want to have exploration. Well, if you've already decided what all the truths are, like free grace theology has, and I'm not, I'm, I consider, especially when it comes to the Calvinism thing, I consider, you know, free grace people to be good guys, if you will. But when it when it comes to the overall 
meaning crisis and the crisis of faith and the mammon church, the free grace theology people are making the same mistake. Um, Calvinism is one artifact of mammon church. Free grace theology is just another artifact of mammon church. Um, provisionism. A lot of people leave Calvinism and they choose provisionism because the propositions are more correct according with scripture. But it's still just a lateral move. You're still down in Mammon Church and you're still just doing a lateral move to another set of propositions. You're not transforming the individual to be able to arrive at correct propositions in the first place. You're just persuading them with superior arguments for different propositions. But they're, they're not becoming any better. So what are you aiming at? What's your relevance realization? Okay, Are you aiming, to, like down here in Mammon Church, for free grace? Think about this. So you t what we're doing now is we're taking free grace and we're considering all these things that we looked at in Mammon Church, all these aspects of Mammon Church versus the Logos Religio. Okay, and In the Mammon Church, you're going to arrive at correct propositional doctrinal conclusions with persuasive explanatory power instilling a high degree of certainty. That's free grace. But what you really want to do is transform, do, be, become better, future, uh, future version of yourself, more like Jesus Christ, agopically aid, and the same for others. Okay. Faith is a moralistic, down in the mammon church, it's a moralistic commitment to affirm systematically disambiguated propositions absent phenomenological or epistemic veracity. That's free grace theology. That's where that is. Rather than faith is agopic, interactive, social connectedness and commitment to fortify the healthy bonds of tension with all meaningful and entities and activities in life. Um, down here in the Mammon Church, you have top-down broadcast, that's grace theology. They have their own systematic theologies and it is top-down broadcast. Okay, It is conclusions being top-down broadcast from a centralized point, whereas in the Logos Religion, you are peer-to-peer -peer mesh network topology, okay? Down here, you have rules and laws. That's free grace theology. Up here, you have appropriateness and expediency. Down here, even in free grace, you have debate, rivalry, scarcity, factionalism. Up here, you have dialogue, non-rivalry, Metcalfe's Law, coherence, you know, the logos as opposed to mammon, which is what you want. So what, what I encourage you to do is if you have this question on free grace theology or, or provisionism or anything like that, okay, is go back to the video on the Mammon Church and as we discuss each one of those, think about where free grace theology is on that thing. And you may also want to watch the video on the four kinds of knowing first so you're tracking on these kinds of things, all right? So lately we did these videos on the Mammon Church and the Faith Crisis and I'm hoping that it constitutes a new baseline of understanding as we move forward and approach the Bible and we're going to be approaching the Bible in a Logos Religio mindset rather than in a Mammon Church mindset. Now this channel, this channel when it started off for the first few years of this channel is a Mammon Church mindset. It is misoriented, it is misguided and it is in pursuit of correct propositional doctrinal conclusions, persuasive explanatory power, stealing a high degree of certainty. And there's still a lot of people who are getting entrapped by Calvinism who find things at that level to be very helpful. But what I really want to do, where I really want us to go together, take this journey together, is to ascend, um, transcend all of that and go metaparadigmatic, go into Logos religion. Let's orient ourselves to transformation. To become, do be, do be and become a better version of our future self, more like Jesus Christ, and agopically aid in the same thing for others. Okay, that's what I would like to see happen. So when it comes to this thing, there's another thing that I kind of left out is that free grace does come. You know, there are some Bible phrases that are used: being justified freely by His grace through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And the idea behind the propositional system is that. In Calvinism, grace is only given to a limited number of people and it's withheld from everybody else. But in free grace theology, they're like, well, grace is for everybody. It's free for everybody. So they're correct about that. So free grace theology has some, it has correct, it has some correct conclusions. But 
having the correct conclusion in having mode doesn't help you do be and become a transformed person. You need to be in being mode, not in having mode. Think about your spouse. My, my wife and I were just talking about this today. We differentiate sometimes like, I don't just have a wife, I'm being a husband. She doesn't just have a husband, she's being a wife. Now, sometimes we kind of joke around, we're like, I like having you in having mode too, like kind of selfishly, I like having you in having mode. So we'll say that too, but we need to distinguish between these things. You don't want to have these propositional conclusions in having mode. You want to do, be, and become better. In Romans chapter 5, it says, We have access by faith into this grace wherein we now stand. And if you keep going into chapter verse 16, it was by um, the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. And that free gift is reworded as the abundance of grace. So free grace. Okay, so there is a biblical basis for using the terminology of free grace. And the gift of righteousness The abundance of grace, which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in one life by one Jesus Christ. Um, That kind of thing. So the phrasing is found in scripture. I mean, that's that's the biblical basis for why they use the term free grace. And I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with that. And there are a lot of um, correct things or things that aren't necessarily wrong in free grace. But the idea that it is proposition centric, okay, It's, it's proposition centric to the detriment of the other three kinds of knowing. There are four kinds of knowing. You want to incorporate all four. Moving back and forth between all four kinds of knowing is one of the ways to uh, stop self-deception and to avoid the meaning crisis and and to become wise, a wise person, right? So, do we have enough time to go through some of these comments here? I might start and go through some of these backwards. I don't know how that would work, though. Somebody said there's no R in tulip because there's <laughs> there's no G in tulip either. There's no gospel. Since there's no R and no G, then tulip is 100% vain and 100% false. Penal substitutionary theory of atonement is the sixth point of Calvinism, okay? Um, yeah, those, those kind of propositional things, you know, who needs them, all right? Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 17, if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, you're yet in your sins. There's some more things down here. Um, is it possible to establish an organized church body using this approach? That's a great question, Brian Johnson. And I'm, I'm interested in trying to get something going terrestrial, but I would say that I don't know of any place right now that is doing that, but I would like to um, find a place that is doing the Logos Religio or create a place. I think we would have to create it. And that's what I'm interested in doing. And uh, one day I might get serious about doing something like that here in Baton Rouge. But for now, we're doing it online with FSI on Wednesday nights, or at least trying to. All right. But there's still there's still a lot of uh, thought inertia there. There's still very mammon church, even though everyone there is on board uh, volitionally. We still have a lot of a lot of thought inertia there. We're trying to work through. So it's it's a difficult thing to do. Um. <laughs> I wouldn't want to call a brother in Christ part of the Church of Mammon because they may not have the best approach to understanding Scripture. See, I don't, I don't want to this Mammon Church thing to become an epithet like a, like uh, something somebody throws out in the middle of a debate because we shouldn't be debating anyway, okay? And or an insult, something like that. The idea is that kind of like how Game A and Game B are separated, and how along game A and game B, you have the blue church and the red religion. What I'm trying to do is simply come up with terminology whereby I can very quickly throw out one phrase. I can quickly throw out, like in future videos, I can throw out one phrase like this, Mammon Church, and then you all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you you understand all of this by me using that one phrase without me having to explain all of that every time. So it's simply a semantic expediency type of thing that I'm trying to create here so that people who have seen the video can follow along more easily with less and less explanation needed to, to follow along. 
Um, I would say both. I lean free grace, but I don't agree. But I don't want to lump myself in with a set of doctrines. However, if you believe the clear gospel, then that's enough to be saved. We want a deeper participatory experience as well, of course. Uh, good evening, Cliff. Good to see you. All right. So I'm out of time, but I wanted to I wanted to address this video, uh, this issue pretty quickly. Somebody asked about what about free grace theology. And I want to use this as an example, an opportunity to go back to our chart from the Mammon Church and consider that set of doctrines through this mindset of Mammon Church versus the Logos religion. And I hope it was helpful. If you have a question, uh, submit it via email. If, uh, and then if I have time, opportunity, I will answer it in a video like this, or I might just reply to your email depending on what the content is. But I get this question a lot, this kind of question a lot, especially, so I figured it would be worth addressing. Um, remember also to like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't, and if you want to support what's going on here, the details are in the description below. Thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day. Somebody had to tell me I was muted. I'm going to have to go cut that out later now. Anyway, I just wanted to say from, sorry for uh, talking on mute on that. I was uh, just saying that from looking at the chats, somebody might be confused that um, I was not trying to cover the issue of how to become saved, how to get saved in this video. And I don't want somebody to be confused that I'm trying to say that something participatory is required, some kind of you know works or something like that. That's not what I'm trying to say. All right. I was not addressing salvation in this. What I was addressing in this video was the conduct and orientation and trajectory of those who are already in Christ and what they should be aimed at and aiming for. And it should not be a systematic proposition, you know, systematically, uh, semantically disambiguated propositional truth claims. Um, it should be transformation, doing, being, becoming more like Christ and reaching out in love and helping others do that. All right. So maybe that'll be it.